context for where we're going, all right? Pharaoh had two dreams. He dreamed first that there were seven fat cows that came up out of the river and then seven lean cows that followed them and then the seven lean cows ate up the seven fat cows. Then he woke up, he was alarmed, and then he went back to sleep. Then he dreamed again that there were seven uh, grains, heads of grain on a stalk that came up on a stalk, seven good healthy heads of grain, and then a stalk beside it came up with seven blighted heads that were blighted, it says, by the east wind, and then the seven blighted heads ate the seven good heads of grain, and then he woke up. And he called all his wise men and everyone together to see if they could interpret it. No one could. They called Joseph, and here's what he said. He said, this is the dream. God did it twice to confirm it to you. And what it means is we're going to have seven years of prosperity, seven good years, but then we're going to have seven years of famine. And the seven years of famine could eat up the seven years of prosperity. So they will not even be remembered because of that. So here's the plan. So that's where I'm going to pick it up. Stay in Malachi, but let me read this to you. Genesis 41, verses 33 through 36. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh, this is Joseph speaking, select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers, officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So I want you to look at Malachi chapter 3, all right? Malachi 3 verse 8. It says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? Now listen, this is the Lord answering. In tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. We're going to come back to that. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes. Bring, one version says, the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, notice again, don't send it to a university. Don't give it to a Christian school. Don't send it to a television ministry. Bring it into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. And try or test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And, and, this is like if you order right now, Here's the bonus. <laughs> I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Now listen to me carefully. Please understand this. Here's what got me so burdened two weeks ago. I have people that I'm pastoring that are under a curse. And I know you're under a curse. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to get you out from under that curse. But you need to understand this. God says because you're not tithing, you are under curse. Listen to me carefully. God is not cursing you. God's not cursing you. You're under curse because we live in a cursed world. A fallen, cursed world. And what God wants to do is bring your finances out from under that curse. So you have to give, though, the first 10% of your income to the Lord because that's how you redeem the rest out from under the curse. Please understand God's not cursing you. Here's what he's saying. You're under a curse. You're under a curse. If you'll bring that tithe into the storehouse, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing on you there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, I hear two testimonies Tithers and non-tithers all give me the same testimony. I've never heard a different testimony from a tither, never heard a different testimony from a non-tither. Here's what tithers, all of them, here's what they say. We are so blessed. Oh, we are so blessed. Would you agree with that, those of you that tithe? We are so blessed. Here's what non-tithers, all non-tithers give the same testimony. I can't afford to tithe. Okay, this does not take a rocket science to figure this out. Listen, I can't afford to tithe. Now listen to me carefully. Listen, if you don't hear anything else, hear this. You will never, never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. You'll never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe because you're under a curse. Tithing is what breaks the curse because every time you start to get ahead, and some of you here who are non-tithers, you would admit to this, every time you start to get ahead, something else breaks. 
Something else goes wrong. Something else happens. You want to know why? Because the devourer is devouring your finances. And he's not only devouring your finances, he's devouring your family. He's devouring your walk with God. He's devouring your kids. He's devouring your marriage. He's a devourer. Why? Listen, he's, God says 10% I'll rebuke the devourer. Listen, just from a business standpoint, that's a good deal. <laughs> Doesn't take a genius to figure this out. So, Exodus 13, and let me show you some things about the tithe that you have to understand. It's so much more important because it is the principle of the first that releases the blessing on us. And Joseph did this. Now, as you're getting to Exodus 13, let me read you another scripture. Uh, Genesis 47, verse 26. Watch this. Genesis 47, 26. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except, watch, except for the land of the priests only, which did not become Pharaoh's. Here, here's, see, we see Joseph saving, and yes, you need to be a good steward. But he says, but whoa, 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 wait a minute. This belongs to God. Pharaoh doesn't get this. The rest of the budget doesn't get this. This belongs to God, and this has to be set apart. This was not an Egyptian pra pra practice. This was an Israeli practice. This was a God principle. All right, so Exodus 13, look at verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, consecrate to me all the firstborn. It's very important to understand the word first in the Bible. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine, or it belongs to me. He uses this same word for first fruits. He uses it for the tithe as well. Then, now look at verse 12. Then you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's or shall belong to God. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with the lamb, and if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. I want to come back to that phrase. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Now, I just want you to notice, by the way, he says, if you don't redeem it, if you don't bring it out from under the curse, you're going to break its neck. Listen to me. Here's what he's saying. You're going to lose it anyway. Please, please hear me. The tithe is going out of your account, whether you give it or the devourer takes it. It's going out. And why don't we give the tithe to God and the other 90% is blessed? 90% with God's blessing goes farther than 100% without. Boy, I, I know many of you know this and you've seen it work. Would you testify to this? Yes. All right. Now, all right, let me give you three points, all right? Here are the three points. Number one, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's what we just read in Exodus. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, how do you know whether you sacrifice it or redeem it? Okay, here's how. If it was a clean animal, it had to be sacrificed like a lamb. If it was an unclean animal, it had to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Now, let me say it one more time, and I know you think this is real Old testament -y. I know you think that, but just stay with me because I'll bring it around to Jesus. The, the, if, it, if you had an animal and it was a clean animal, it had to be sacrificed. If it was an unclean animal, it had to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean animal. Okay, now, everything in the Bible points to Jesus. Everything. Let me tell you how this points to Jesus. Were you born clean or unclean? Unclean, because we were born in sin, right? We were born with a sin nature. I can prove it very easily. Those of you who are parents, I'll ask you one question. Did you have to teach your children to be bad? <laughs> or did it come naturally for them? Natural, right? Okay, so we were all born unclean, okay? Let me ask you this. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Clean. Listen, the clean had to be sacrificed so the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read in our Bibles. That's what this represents. But here's what you need to understand. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren, the Bible tells us. The firstborn, okay, the firstborn clean had to be sacrificed so we, the firstborn unclean, could be redeemed. So let me tell you what this is. So, so many people, they talk about tithing and they talk about it in a negative way. And it so hurts my heart because they don't understand. You, do, you don't even understand. You're talking about Jesus. Listen to me carefully. Jesus is God's tithe. Because you see, you give the tithe first. 
You give the tithe in faith. See, God didn't say, wait till your sheep has 10 lambs and then give me one. He said, give me the first one. When you don't have any more, you just have the promise the more you only have one. Okay, it takes faith to give the first. See, it's the principle of faith that releases the blessing on our finances. It's not the last 10%, it's the first 10%. And in the same way, God gave Jesus first before we repented. The Bible says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So God gave Jesus first in faith, hoping that we would repent and turn to him. So the firstborn belongs to God, all right? Now let me show you something else. Number two, the first fruits must be offered. The first fruits must be offered. All right, let me read you a few scriptures. Stay in Exodus 13. Exodus 23, verse 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. Now, let me say it again. Let me just notice this word. It doesn't say that you give the tithe. Do you know why the Bible doesn't use the word give, but it uses the word bring when it talks about tithing? Because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only bring it. And you're supposed to bring it to the house of the Lord. That's what we read in Malachi 3. Let me read you another scripture, Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Have you ever thought about this? Why did God ask for all of the silver and the gold from Jericho? When they went in to conquer the promised land, he said, bring, bring, he didn't say give, bring all of the silver and gold into the house of the Lord. It's consecrated or set apart for the house of God. Do you know why he said that? Because Jericho was the first city. What he's saying is, you give me the first, the rest are blessed. The rest are redeemed out from under the curse. He didn't say conquer 10 cities and then give me one. Choose which one you want to give me or give me the last one. He said, you give me the first one and the rest are redeemed. It's all through Scripture when you understand this principle. Why did God accept Abel's offering? Remember Cain and Abel, the very beginning, sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Why did God accept Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's offering? If you understand firstborn and first fruits, you understand it. Firstborn belongs to God. First fruits belong to God. Okay, watch very carefully. I'll read it for you. Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, now those words are very important. Notice not at the beginning or at the first of the harvest, just in the process of time, it came to pass, in other words, whenever he felt like it, that Cain brought an offering. Notice it never says first. An offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the, what? Firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected or received Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. It's very simple. God doesn't receive second. God will never be in second place. I don't care what you say about it or where you think you've got God in your life. I'm telling you, it never lowers God. <laughs> God is preeminent. That means he's higher than all. He's before all. He's above all. He's first of all. God is always first. God is perfect. God can never do anything wrong. He can never not be perfect. He can never not be first. If God plays 18 holes of golf, his score will be 18. Because if he hits the ball, it's going in the hole. Okay, listen to me. God's first. Listen very carefully. When you give him an offering that's not first, it is not accepted. It is in his nature, in his character, who he is, he cannot accept it. He couldn't accept Cain's offering because it wasn't first fruits. He only accepts firstborn first fruits. I know people who give every now and then and give in the process of time an offering, whatever they feel like. They determine the amount and they determine the time. Listen to me, the curse is still on you because God accepts only the first. So here's number three, the tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus 27, 30, and all the tithe of the land. You, you know what the Hebrew word for all means? Yeah, all. <laughs> all the tithe of the land whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. There it is again. It belongs to the Lord. It is holy or it is set apart to the Lord. Don't touch what's holy. Don't leave it in your account. Give it to the Lord. Bring it to the house of God. 
Okay, the firstborn belongs to God, first fruits belong to God, the tithe belongs to God. Okay, now let me just ask you a question. I'm going to ask you two questions, and, and so just stay with me, all right? You have $1,000, you have 10 $100 bills in your hand, a tithe is 10%, so how, you have $1,000, how much is the tithe? $100. I know this is math, uh, I'm, I, but I'll get off of it as quickly as I can, okay? All right? All right, now, so you have 10 $100 bills, the tithe is $100, so it's one of those bills, right? Okay, which one is the tithe? Yeah, you're saying that because you're in church, but you're, uh, and you're listening to this message, but how do you know which one the first one is? Listen to carefully, I can tell you how. It's the first one that leaves your hand. That's the tithe. The first one that leaves your hand, and listen, here's what the Bible says, the first one is the redemptive portion. It has the blessing. The first one has the potential to redeem the other nine out from under the curse. But here's what some people do. They say, okay, let me set aside some for the mortgage, some for the electric company, some for groceries. Oh, I don't have enough left over for God. Okay. Or then they say, and God, here's your portion. Okay, listen to me carefully. He doesn't accept that. He will not accept last place. And here's the problem. You gave the one with the blessing on it to the mortgage company. The mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. And after the last few years, you ought to know that. Only God has the power. Here's what you do. You say, God, here's yours first. Here's the tithe. Here's what belongs to you. And now these other nine are blessed. Now, listen to me. I am not legalistic about it. I'm not legalistic about it. It is your heart. It is your heart. And some of you give 10%. You say, but, well, Pastor Robert, I haven't been giving the first. I didn't know to. It's okay. It's your, God sees your heart. And to him who knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. But, by the way, now you know. Now, you know, it's the first one. I'm not legalistic and God's not legalistic. It's your heart. But let me tell you, when, when you put God first, everything else falls in place. Here's my burden. Here's my burden as your pastor. You're asking me to help you with two, three, four, five, and six in your life. You're asking me to help you with your marriage, with your, your, with your finances, with your health, with your family, with your job. You're asking me to help you in all these areas. You're asking me to help you put your life in order. But I cannot, I cannot put two, three, four, five, and six in order in your life if you won't put number one in order. I can't do it. That's up to you. If you'll put God, and listen, if you put God first, everything else lines up. When you don't have God first, everything in your life's out of order. When you have God first, everything else is in order because God's a God of order. Let me show you one more scripture. We, in Exodus 13, you still there? Remember we were talking about the firstborn? Okay, here's what God says about it. We left off at verse 13. Look at verse 14. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? In other words, why are you killing this lamb? that you shall say to him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, here's what he said is going to happen. Uh, think about a little kid runs into the house and says, Dad, 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 the sheep is having its firstborn lamb. Oh, great. And so the whole family runs out to the barn, and they all watch you, and they say, Oh, the miracle of birth. Praise the Lord. And then the dad takes the little lamb, goes over, cuts his throat, and kills it. And the little kid is watching this. Of course, you know what he's thinking, don't you? I'm not messing with Dad. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what that lamb did. He wasn't even here very long, but I know if you get Dad mad. <laughs> I'm not messing with that. Dad. dad says, sit down, I'm sitting down. You know, okay. All right. So, but he, what he's saying is, is one day your son's going to get older. And your son is going to notice you do this with all the firstborn. And one day he's going to wonder about it. So one day, he's, here's what he said, you're going to walk into the room and, and your son's going to say, Dad, um, have a seat. Um, there's a, a habit that you have, uh, and I'm not even sure you know that you do this, Dad. I just... But um, every time uh, one of our animals has a, a firstborn, um, you um, uh, kill it. And um, Dad, um, we're, uh, we're in the ranching business. And, and th this is cutting into our profits. I've, I've been going over the books, Dad, and um, I, I just, 
Uh, and again, you might not even be aware of it, but I just, I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And he said, when your son says that to you, you say to him, son, I need to tell you something about our family that you don't know. We haven't always been in the ranching business. As a matter of fact, we used to be slaves. We didn't own any sheep. We didn't own any land. We were in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, delivered us. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn of all of our animals. Now, listen, here this is written 4,000 years ago, you know? And yet I had this happen with all three of my kids, all three of my kids, and all three of my kids are grown, married, and tithers now, all of them. And they all testify to the benefits and the blessings of it because they've gone through seasons like all of us where they struggle with it, and then they got back on track, and they testify to it. Listen to me, listen. My, 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 I remember my oldest son, when he got kind of old enough to kind of read and write and, you know, no numbers and all that. I, I'm in the office one day, and I'm, I'm paying the bills, and I'm writing checks. So I write the tithe check first. I put it over to the side, and then I'm going to pay the other. For you younger people here, we used to have these pieces of paper <laughs> called uh, checks. <laughs> okay, right. so, so I put the tithe check over here, wrote it first, and then, I, and then when I go to church, I'm going to take it, but I wrote it first. And now I'm paying the bills, you know, doing, I've done God's part. And my son comes in and he sees it. And he said, Dad, he sees the amount. You know, a tie check to a kid looks like a gazillion dollars. Good sign right there. All right, we're going to read quite a few scriptures because I want us to catch this story. Genesis 37, look at verse 1. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. Remember, I told you he was 17. Was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah. Now, one of those was Leah, Leah's uh, sons, uh, Leah's maid, and one was Rachel's maid, Zilpah and Bilhah. I'm sure they were lovely girls. Um, <laughs> but you have to remember that Joseph, his mother was Rachel. Joseph and Benjamin, uh, Leah had six sons. This is how we get the 12 tribes. Uh, Zilpah had two, uh, Bilhah had two, and uh, then Rachel had two. And so these are his half-brothers that he's with, all right? So, uh, but uh, his father's wives now. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. I just want you to notice, before he ever has a dream, he's already a tattletale. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he was the son by Rachel. Also, he made him a tunic or a coat, would be the best way to say that for us, a coat of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream. Now remember his brothers hate him. Just want you to remember that, all right? Because you're going to see in a moment what 17-year-olds do. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. <laughs> you know, when we read the dream here, you're just going to be in awe of the wisdom to tell this dream to older brothers that hate you. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field, and then behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. <laughs> That's just brilliant to tell bigger brothers that, isn't it? And his brothers said to him, shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you have indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words, the way he talked about himself and his dreams. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers. He never learned. <laughs> and said, look, I've dreamed another dream. I'm sure they're excited about hearing the second dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bow down to me. <laughs> 
17. Do you remember 17? Okay. <clears throat> so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said, What is this that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. He has a dream, and he tells them. And by the way, I told you he was 17. Genesis 41, 40, 46 says Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh king. So he's 17 when he gets it. He's 30 when he steps into his destiny. What happens between the dream and the destiny? Well, these are the tests we're going to talk about. But I want to establish something at the beginning of this series with point number one, all right? So here's point number one. God has a dream for you. God has a dream for you. Joseph gets this dream, and here's something about this dream that we need to understand. This dream was from God. Joseph bragging about it was not from God, but his dream was from God. Both of his dreams were from God, and God's dream for your life is better than your dream. And his destiny for you is bigger than your destiny. I promise you. Because God's always better and he's always bigger than us. Now, how can you know the dream that God has for you? You ever thought about that? How can you know God's dream for your life? Let me give you one very practical way to know this. Let me read you this verse. Numbers 12 verse 6 says, Then he said, this is God speaking, Hear now my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. That's a really good thing to understand about being able to hear God. I speak with him face to face, even plainly. Okay, let me just tell you very, very simply. If you'd like to know God's dream for your life, get to know God. Get to know God. Get to know the giver of the dream. Get to know, listen to this, get to know the one who can reveal it and fulfill it. Get to know the one who can reveal it and fulfill it. That's a good tweet for all you tweeters, all right? <laughs> the children of Israel, the Bible says, knew his acts. The children of Israel knew God's acts. Moses knew his ways. If you want to know what God's dream is for your life, get to know God. And God will speak to every one of us plainly face to face. He says he spoke to Moses as a friend. And Jesus said, no longer do I call you servants. I call you friends. For a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But a friend does. So we've got to get to know God. So God has a dream for every person here. But listen to me carefully. We also can have dreams. We can have selfish dreams. And those selfish dreams can cloud us from hearing God's dream. And there are some dreams that you just need to lay down. You just need to lay them down. For instance, let me give an illustration. How many of you men um, are over 40? Don't raise your hand yet. You're over 40. And in school, whether high school or college, you played football. Can I see your hand? Put your hands up. Okay. Okay. Listen to me. The Cowboys are not going to call. <laughs> that they're not going to call. Just give up on that dream. It's not going to happen. I promise you it will not happen. See, there are some dreams that we have that they're dreams, but they're just not from God. So we have to find the dream that God has for us. The only way you'll ever find God's dream is to get to know God, all right? So when you get the dream, though, what do you do? Well, here's point number two. Don't brag about the dream. Don't brag about the dream. Listen to me carefully. The dream leads you to God's destiny. Listen, and if you brag about it, you'll never get to the destiny God has for your life. I know people that brag all the time about God's call on their life, God's dream. Pastor, let me tell you God's call on my life. You don't need to tell me. You just need to be faithful in all his house. You just need to be faithful to God. And yet we just brag and brag and brag. And it says his brothers hated him for his dreams and for his words. This is the pride test. And in my opinion, Joseph failed the first test. He fails the pride test. God gives him a dream and he immediately goes out and brags about it. And tells everybody his dream. Tells his brothers his dreams. Well, you know, I say, I'm saying he failed it 
actually with God, I, I believe that we actually never fail a test. We just take it over and over and over again until we pass it. Isn't that great? God is such a gracious God, he gives you another chance. So if you've ever failed a test from God, guess what? You're gonna get another chance. I don't think God puts F at the top of our papers. I think he puts retake. <laughs> Just retake it. So you can't move away when you have a problem. You gotta pass whatever that test is, you gotta pass it. And we've gotta stop bragging. Now, stop bragging, stop bragging. Now listen to me, for some of us to stop bragging, because you might even say, well I do it all the time and I don't wanna do it and I try not to do it. So you're gonna to have to help me, okay, I'm going to help you. For some people to stop bragging, you're going to have to stop talking. <laughs> because when you talk, if you're, it's like if, if his mouth is moving, he's lying. You ever heard that expression? Okay, sometimes when your mouth is moving, you're just bragging. Uh, now, I, I am a person that thinks out loud. There are some people who, who uh, think uh, before they speak. I try to do that, I really do. There are some people who think while they speak, that's me. I'm kind of talking, some of you are laughing, you're looking at your spouse and your spouse is mad. Uh, but you know, you just, some, that's me. I, I, I kind of think while I'm talking. And then there are some people that think after they talk. <laughs> and then there are some people that never think. But the point is, I, I just talk a lot. I'm just a very verbal person. But I knew as God began to work in my life that I talked too much. I just knew that. So years ago, I said to Debbie, will you kick me under the table just, and just you know, lightly, you know, uh, but do it on the shin. So I'll, if I'm talking too much, just kind of bump me. And if I don't stop, then do it a little harder. I, my legs were black and blue for years. She was helping me. I'm just saying to you, if you wanna know why you're not fulfilling your destiny and other people around you are, you may need to pass the pride test. And one of the ways we pass it is stop bragging. Now, why do we brag? You ever thought about this? Why do we brag? Let me tell you why we brag. Because pride's in our heart. Uh, Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now listen to me, because I'm going to blow away an old thing. I've heard this many times, and I think to myself, have they never read the Bible? Listen, I can tell what's in your heart. I can. I just have to listen to your mouth for a little while. And here's what people say. Well, you don't know what's in my heart. Well, I'm getting a pretty good idea by looking at the thing on your face right now and the words coming out of your mouth. You don't know what's in my heart. Listen, we do. I may not know everything that's in your heart, but the reason that we brag is because pride's in the heart. We've got to deal with the heart. It's very, very clear that if there's something in our heart, it's going to come out of our mouth. If we speak and it's in our heart, it's going to come out. Pride, listen, pride always has to have a voice. Pride always has to be or wants to be heard. Pride always wants to give its opinion. Let me give you another example of pride. Pride always interrupts other people. <laughs> You're just real quiet today. <laughs> Do you have a problem interrupting people? Do you know why? You're a prideful person. That's why. Because your opinion is more important than their opinion. So they're halfway through and you've got to jump in. And you've got to say what you want to say. That's pride. We have to deal with this or we will never fulfill God's destiny for our life. Now, I want to tell you something that's absolutely unbelievable to me about this passage that I didn't see the first time I preached this. I just saw this this week. I'm not taking just my sermons. I'm going back, studying it, praying over it, seeking God, and I'm getting all sorts of new revelation that I didn't see eight, eight years ago when I preached this. Joseph brought a bad report of his brother's to his father before he got the dream. He's already a tattletale. He already has a problem with his mouth. And remember, if you have a problem with your mouth, you have a problem with your heart. He's already got it. And then God gives him a dream of his brothers bowing down to him. 
Now listen to me carefully. That dream was not Joseph's destiny. His destiny, his purpose on this earth was not to get his brothers to bow down to him. His purpose was to save multitudes of people. His purpose was to be the second in command in the greatest nation on the earth at that time and to store up grain that during a seven-year famine, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives could be saved. That's his purpose. Why didn't God give him a dream about saving multitudes? Why didn't he say, I had a dream about that if I would be a good steward, that God would use me to help other people one day? Uh, there's a couple reasons why. First of all, that doesn't motivate most of us when we're young. When we're immature in the Lord, it doesn't motivate us to help a lot of people. It motivates us to be well-known or to have power or to have success. So listen to me carefully. Listen, listen, listen. So many people, they get this all mixed up. Listen, yes, maybe you have a dream about you being great, but you being great is not God's purpose for your life. You helping a lot of people is God's purpose for your life. And as we mature in the Lord, we realize, yes, God may give me great influence one day, but that influence is for his purposes, not for my purposes. And that maturity begins to happen in our life. So possibly God gave him this dream because the dream of helping a lot of people wouldn't have motivated him at that. Secondly, God may have given him this dream because this dream would reveal what was in his heart. Is it possible that God has given you a dream and he's actually using that dream to work some things out of your life so you can fulfill the destiny God has for you? Are, are y'all following me? Am I making this clear? Because this is really good stuff. This is very good. I'm telling you, listen, the dream, the dream from God is not the same as the destiny. The dream is simply what starts us on the path to maturity so we can handle the destiny. And can I say this? If you can't even handle the dream, you can't handle the destiny. If you can't be humble with the dream, listen, if you can't be humble with the dream, you will never have the destiny because the destiny would destroy you. And God knows that. So he gives you the dream to reveal the pride or to bring it to the surface like a pot of gold and you turn the fire up under it and the dross comes to the top and you scrape it off. I'm telling you, God gives you a dream, a good dream and a big dream to get some stuff out of you so he can make you pure enough to be able to handle the destiny that he has for you. So if you're going to move from your dream to your destiny, you got to believe God has a dream for you. And then when you get the dream, don't brag about it. And then number three is deal with the root of pride. We've got to pass the pride test. So how are we going to pass it? Deal with the root of pride. All right, let me ask you a question. I want all of you uh, at, at all the campuses to raise your hand, all right, if, this, if, you, if you agree with this. How many of you at some time in your life have dealt with pride? Can I see your hand? The rest of you are dealing with it right now because you didn't raise your hand. Okay, all right. <laughs> Now, how many of you have dealt with pride in your life more than once? Can I see your hand? Yes. You know why? There's a couple of reasons. First of all, many of us deal with the fruit and not the root. Many of us see the pride and we say, well, that, that, that pride, now I just made these prideful statements, so again, I'm going to not talk as much. But the pride's still there. It's still there. So we've got to do something to deal with the root. And what is the root of pride? Listen to me carefully. Insecurity is the root of all pride. All pride is rooted in insecurity. If you ever see a prideful person, you're seeing an insecure person. If pride, listen to this. Here's another great tweet. Listen, if pride, if pride is in your heart, insecurity is in your soul. If pride is in your heart, Insecurity is in your soul. That's why we talk about we need the healing of the soul, such as freedom ministry and kairos and things like that that help us. Our souls have to be healed because as long as there is insecurity in our souls, pride's in our heart. 
Now, I said, well, that's one of the reasons. Here's, here's uh, another reason that we have to redo this or, 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 or uh, continue to deal with, with pride. Because with every new challenge comes new insecurities. Let me say it another way. With every new level of responsibility comes new insecurities. New insecurity. In other words, we're doing great. We're doing fine. We've walked with God. We've really sought God. We're in a position, and boy, we're just doing great. And all of a sudden, we get a promotion. We get a new position. We get a new leadership assignment, a new ministry position at the church, whatever. And all of a sudden, oh, man, I can't do this. You know, we, we were a, a greeter or, or, or an usher or a servant in some way. And all of a sudden, they say, listen, we'd like for you to be the, the leader now uh, of the greeters. We'd like you to be one of the team leaders, and we'd like for you to organize Oh, I, I don't know if I could do that. And all of a sudden, there we go. But here's the problem. You can't deal with it by becoming more confident in yourself because then you'll have pride. You have to be more confident in Jesus. You can't just say, you know what, after a few months or weeks and it's going real well, boy, I am pretty good at this. I, I, I probably should lead several of these things because I'm really good. <laughs> because then the pride comes again. So when there's insecurity,